Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brian Honigman, and today I want to talk about a frustration I have as both a marketer and a consumer. Uh, too often is there bad instances of marketing as opposed to that really compelling marketing that moves the needle. Way too often, us as marketers fall into the trap of overselling, trying too hard, coming off too pushy, and I want to help solve that problem. The reason this exists, the reason why we often at times overuse a channel or inundate our customers with the wrong kinds of messaging is because as marketers, we tend to follow the leader. We see what our competitors are doing, see where they're getting results, and we try to emulate, try to get the same results. And that makes sense. We do the same thing when it comes to monitoring what our customers and consumers are doing, right? We want to be where our customers are paying attention, and we want to be there in an impactful way. But whenever a new shiny object appears, like Instagram Stories, right, newly added to Instagram not so long ago, every brand and their mother jumps on it to try to be active, to try to get someone's attention. And there's pros and cons to this. The pros, right, you want to be where your customers are, you want to be uh, an active part of their life. But the problem is, as marketers, we don't operate within a silo, right? Our actions as a whole influence one another. Because when I'm jumping on Instagram stories, it's likely that many other brands are jumping on it, overusing the platform and eventually uh, diminishing the results that you'll receive over time. These tactics uh, need to be a part of a greater mix that you're working on at any one point in time as opposed to everyone using them at the same time and eventually irritating consumers in the process. One example of an irritating uh, marketing technique that's been overused and in inundating marketers, and I myself as a consumer have been annoyed by it, is the use of uh, numeric listicles, right? We've all seen the articles of five reasons to quit dairy, four perspectives on planning, five cool facts about the dollar bill. These are six examples of six different vastly, uh, vastly different companies using that, this technique as a way to add a headline to their article. The reason they used it is because, yes, it is effective to you know, use a numeric listicle because a reader can quickly understand what an article is about. The problem is that everyone's doing it, so the effectiveness drops dramatically. And I'm not talking down to you because I myself has fallen into this trap before as well. When I first started writing about marketing about five years ago, a lot more of the articles I was producing were using uh, you know, this type of headline. We're focused around the, the numeric listicle. Nine ways to add LinkedIn to your company website. Five secrets to increasing customer retention. Blah, 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 blah. And after a while, I started to realize that overusing this tactic was not getting me the results I once saw originally. So since then, I've obviously scaled back. I still use this uh, headline technique in some of my articles, but I use it as, a, as a, uh, one tactic in a variety of ways I'm structuring the headline of an article. I pulled back because after a while, oh, the overuse, the inundating of your audience leads to diminishing returns based off of an, uh, a principle in Ecom 101. The more you input, uh, more input you provide to a, uh, an approach over time, you're eventually going to reach a threshold and you're going to see a plateau and diminishing returns, right? You're going to see your efforts no longer succeed like they once did because you're overdoing it. Uh, a study by Track Social found that uh, when brands post on a Facebook page, their own Facebook page, uh, how many times they post per day on their Facebook page, when they post between one to three times, they see a decent amount of engagement. When they start posting between four to seven times in the same day on their Facebook page, engagement drops significantly. Why? Because it's really annoying to hear from the same brand seven times on Facebook in one day, right? Who wants to hear from their chiropractor or their favorite shoe brand that many times in a day at all, let alone on the same exact channel? And this is a proof of how, you're, how if you overuse something, 
you're going to, uh, a particular marketing uh, tactic, you'll eventually see diminishing results. So when your marketing feels too much like marketing, it's starting to feel icky, pushy, uh, it's overused. You're overusing the same exact tactics as everyone else. You're inundating your customers with too much messaging on the same channels everyone else is, and you're definitely seeing diminish, diminishing results. It's time to take a step back. And I, my hope is that you can avoid this altogether and instead practice moderation with your marketing. Moderation allows you to counterbalance what you're doing at any one point in time. So you're not oversaturating your audience with excessive messaging uh, and you know, distracting them from the point of your communications to build a bond with them, to sell to them, etc. My hope is that also you become a helpful reminder in their day with your marketing as opposed to a, you know, a disruptive force as they view Twitter or open their email. So one of the ways you can practice moderation with your marketing is first tying back everything you're doing as an organization to why you exist in your first place or your company's purpose. This is based off of the golden circle concept that Simon Sinek, the famous author, introduced in his TED talk. Uh, and basically, he identified that the most successful companies across industries lead, communicate, and organize themselves around why they exist, around their core purpose as an institution, as opposed to how they do what they do or what they actually do, their products or services. They lead with the reason why their employees get up in the morning. They lead with their mission statement beyond generating profits and uh, you know, employing people. The, the how, the how you do what you do as an organization should be informed by why you exist, which is kind of also the, the strategy. And then what you actually do, the products and services, are the tactics. So it's a reciprocal process of that your purpose should be a driving force for everything you're doing, especially from a marketing standpoint. And then that strategy is informed, and then that purpose informs the strategies and tactics you'll then implement. So what does this matter when it, uh, when it comes to practicing moderation with your marketing? When you have a clear understanding about what you're focused on, you can set constraints for what you're doing, right? You can create uh, creative limitations for how your organization is going to operate from a marketing capacity, right? You have a clear understanding of what tactics you'll be using, what topics you'll be covering, which channels you're on and which ones you're not on, which beliefs and values you support, and that'll help direct you so that you're not all over the place, overusing the wrong channels, covering the wrong topics, and really help give you a focus. So an example of organization leading with their why and really landing their marketing behind their purpose. Let's talk about SPAR. SPAR is an international grocery store chain of 12,000 locations in Africa and Europe primarily. The organization's purpose is to foster collaboration. Their mission statement is that we work far better together than we do on our own. And, and that's seen throughout their business, not just from a marketing standpoint. The 12,000 grocery stores are independently owned, but they share the same uh, goods and distribution networks. So they're able to have autonomy, but also work together to succeed, to, to find more success uh, through that collaboration. And this is apparent throughout their marketing. On a monthly basis, uh, SPAR re uh, releases the SPAR Saver magazine um, you know, at the first of the month, uh, at the beginning of the month, excuse me, um, to kind of break up their messaging. So they're not inundating you with excessive information about their latest products and trying to reach you more than you actually want to hear from a grocery store, but they have set up a specific cadence um, to, for where their, from where their customers should expect to hear from them. And then in this magazine, they include articles, infographics, videos, there's recipes for how to uh, cook certain meals using their products with your family. Again, fostering collaboration in the family. Uh, they have event listings for what's going on in your uh, local neighborhood and community. So fostering kind of uh, cooperation and on a local level. So anything that they're covering with their content 
if it's not product focus, which is obviously clear why they're talking about it, it's tied in in some capacity to the brand's lifestyle, which all revolves around fostering uh, collaboration. And what's interesting about this is that they're able to release a new issue each month, and then in between the, those issues, they'll pull individual pieces of content so that uh, they can share them on Facebook or social media or on email newsletter. So they're kind of recycling what they're already talked about, uh, but in a, in a new way. They're repurposing what they're doing. As seen here on the right, they pulled uh, this Facebook post uh, from what they talked about in a recent uh, issue about exercising. And it's a quick reminder in your feed, hey, remember the last issue we referenced exercising? It's a, an activity you as a family can do together to uh, to cooperate and live a healthier lifestyle. It's not intrusive. It's matched with Facebook's, uh, you know, the channel, what kind of content consumers expect. And if someone is interested in diving further and going back to the actual uh, issue that they're referencing, they click on the link and they have access to all the content on the left, which is an exercise readiness questionnaire, a cardio plan, an exercise reference sheet, all this great information that they already previously covered in the issue, but they're not shoving it down your throat. They're saying once a month, expect a lot of content from us. Obviously, you can choose to consume as much or as little of it. And in between those issues, we'll be reaching you in a non-intrusive way with a little bit, a light pepper of messaging across our different channels. So your organization should be consider doing this, should consider doing this as well. And by when I say this, I mean establishing a clear purpose around you know, what your organization stands for and defining that very clearly. The first thing you need to do if you don't know what that purpose is, is conduct an audit internally. You need to talk with your team, team members, uh, communicate across departments, hold meetings, and figure out, okay, what is our core purpose, our leading mission statement beyond profits, beyond uh, employing people? You need to have that core understanding internally, and then you need to conduct third-party research to figure out what consumers think your core purpose is, because if those two aren't aligned, that's a big problem, right? You want to align with, you want your customers to align what you think your purpose is, and if there's any uh, gap there, you need to, you know, use marketing and take action to fix that gap. So you get customer feedback about your purpose, what, what people think your purpose is, through launching a survey, doing focus groups, or even interviewing existing customers to find out what they really think about your brand. Uh, second, uh, thirdly, you need to sync with leadership. This is easier and smaller to mid-sized companies, but at big brands as well, you need to get the download from the company founder, the C-suite, any leadership you have access to, to get the story behind the brand, to get that core purpose articulated, and also get them on board, because without their buy-in, leading with your why won't go very far. And last but not least, you need to document this whole process in a brand blueprint. It's time intensive to figure out what your organization's purpose is, and you're not going to want to do this multiple times. But if you document the whole process, yes, your purpose will evolve over time slightly and you can update the document. But overall, you'll always have this as a reference to go back to when you're deciding, should we invest in this marketing campaign, this channel, this tactic? And if there's ever a disagreement about how it aligns with your purpose, you can go back to the brand blueprint and figure it out from there. The second thing you can do to better practice moderation with your marketing is to add variety to diversify your marketing bets. So one of the issues with uh, you know, being too aggressive with marketing is inundating people on the same channel repeatedly. You're, you're talking to them uh, with too much repetition, with the wrong types of content, and it comes off as aggressive and doesn't you know, help you in any way, especially in the long term. So to add variety to your marketing so you're reaching people in different places with the right type of messaging, you need to make a few marketing bets. You know, too often do organizations make one big marketing bet, right? You know, Snapchat is our, the holy grail for us and that's what's gonna take us to the next level. Well, that can get really annoying really quickly because then you can start inundating your audience, unfortunately, and, and message them too much, spending too much time there. And also it's really risky. I think you need to take risks as a marketer, but it's an unnecessary risk to focus all of your time and attention on one tactic, one channel, um, because what if it goes away? What if you no longer are able to see results there? Then you're gonna be running around trying to figure out 
um, what's your next bet. Uh, on the other hand, on the other extreme, if you're making too many bets, and I would say this is what a majority of marketers do incorrectly, is they're spread way too thin. They're active on 10 or 20 different channels in a haphazard way, right? You're very thin with your effort on each of those channels. And this comes out of having to show as a marketer that you're, at, you're doing marketing activities, you're trying to figure it out, trying to make it work, but by spreading yourself so thin, it's not easy to consistently reach your audience, and it's not, it's not um, as comprehensive to get your purpose across as an organization, right? When you're there in, in a haphazard way and you don't have the resources to use all these channels, um, you're going to fall short. So instead, you need to make a few marketing bets on a few channels so that you can add and subtract to your mix at any time. You have a couple investments going concurrently. So if anything doesn't work or some experiment fails or a channel disappears, you have other marketing investments to rely on that you can fall back on that you already have in motion that you can work on. Um, and, and you're also not spreading yourself too thin. You have the resources allocated correctly. Um, and you're able to hit that variety uh, of, of touch points in a consumer's day. So, for example, uh, this isn't what you need to have to, you know, add variety, but this is just an example of what um, making a few marketing bets. If your organization was only focused on four channels, that could be great. Let's say you focus on a blog, Pinterest, Facebook, podcast. That's plenty of work for one marketer full-time, let alone a, a whole team could work on those four channels alone and see great success because the amount of tactics that you're able to utilize in all of these channels are numerous. So I, I can't recommend enough diversifying your marketing mix, but only making a few bets, not too little, not too many, but finding the right balance for you. Uh, Patagonia does this really, really well. Uh, Patagonia is the outerwear company. They sell camping gear and clothing, hiking gear, uh, skiing stuff. I don't know, I'm not really sporty. But uh, all kinds of good stuff. And their core purpose is to educate uh, people about, or educate their customers about, you know, how to protect the environment and also eco-friendly business practices, right? Because all their clothes are eco-friendly. And, you know, they're really adamant about protecting the environment and which is the spaces in which their clothing, the products they sell, are, are used in. And they articulate this uh, succinctly across a couple core channels. They make a few marketing bets to have enough variety, right? They're active on the cleanest line, their blog, the Dirtbag Diaries, their podcast. They have Instagram, YouTube, blah, blah, blah. They have a couple channels where they're able to dive deep, really understand what works on each of those channels, and share their message in a different way. Uh, on YouTube, they have some product-focused videos, which is great, but then they also have at-length documentaries about the water crisis, right? Whereas if you, you, you can't upload that long of a video, but if you try to, you know, upload a lengthy, really heavy, uh, you know, uh, documentary about the water issue in a certain country or here in America onto Instagram, it might not work as well. People are just looking for beautiful photos um, or maybe something else more specific from you and, and as they pass through their feed. Uh, and that really wouldn't make sense. Instead, you wanna sh they want to share uh, beautiful images of national parks um, and, and provide quick blurbs about uh, the, the topics and the issues that they care about. So they're not again, pushing in your face, you need to protect the environment, but they're lightly messing, messaging you with different contexts in mind across different channels, um, always articulating their core purpose. How do they do this? By testing on a consistent basis. And this is what your organization should do as well, to test to figure out what your ideal marketing mix is. What are your few marketing bets? So let's go through this really short and straightforward testing framework. First, you need to select a hypothesis. So let's do an example. Uh, your organization wants to make YouTube a leading channel for your brand. Uh, okay, that's very general. Now let's choose a goal. A more specific goal is uh, you want 100,000 subscribers. You want YouTube to be a, a top five conversion source for your organization. Great. You need to set a sensible timeline, a, a, a firm start, an end date. Let's say that's going to take a year and a half for, really, for us to really build out 
uh, you know, a worthwhile YouTube channel. And then the most important step is identifying the necessary resources to execute that test to see if that channel is worthwhile or not. This is where most organizations fail because the difference between successful marketers and wishy-washy marketers is execution. We all have tons of great ideas and dreams, but what do you actually need to execute against that hypothesis? So in this case with YouTube, uh, maybe we need to pull our copywriter in, have her work with us four hours a week. Maybe we need a budget of $5,000. Whatever it may be, you need to be really honest about what resources you need. Uh, at that point, you can start executing your tests, you know, launching the YouTube channel, regularly uploading videos, etc. And as you're going, the next step is to measure your success on a consistent basis. So you don't want to just measure at the end because that's, you know, not very clear. You're going to be missing a lot of information in, in between. You want to be measuring in real time what's happening so you can add and subtract to your investment to make sure your test succeeds because that's the goal of every test is for it to succeed, which they all won't, but you want to do your best to make sure that um, you're giving it your all. And then last but not least, at the end of this sensible timeline that you're setting, you need to decide on a future, if you're going to invest in this channel in the future. Is this worth worthwhile place for us to be? Did we reach our goal? What results were driven? Should we continue forward? Should we cease activity on this channel or with this tactic, etc.? Taco Bell uses this exact framework when they were testing out uh, the new or formerly new uh, social network called Feed. In about 2013, there was a uh, kind of teenage social network, a precursor to Snapchat that was new on the scene. And it seemed like, you know, it was getting a lot of attention, a top download app in the, app, in the iTunes app store. Taco Bell said, hey, I want to I wanna try that. I think we should be active there. It makes sense for our demographic. So what should we do? Uh, we're going to go through that testing framework. And when they got to that really important step of identifying what resources they need, they said, you know, we're not really sure if this is going to be a viable channel. It's so new. The space changes pretty often. Uh, instead of reinventing the wheel and creating original content, in this case, we're going to pull what we're already sharing on Instagram, what we're already sharing on Facebook, change the captions up, use the same images, maybe use uh, images from the same photo shoot, just an angle we didn't show before. So they're, using, they're making use of what they already had as opposed to trying to reinvent the wheel. And that way, if this investment fails, then it wasn't too much of a loss. And it's just a quick testing period. I think they did it for about a six months to a year for them. That's, that's a quick period of time. It, uh, in consideration all the other marketing activities they have going on at any one time as a big organization. Um, and at the end of the test, they realized that, in fact, it wasn't worth the investment. They really weren't getting a lot of results, and they decided not to move further, which, in hindsight, was a great move. Also, feed doesn't exist anymore. Feed got bought or sold or turned off. Who cares? Either way, without a fortune teller, they were able to be really honest with themselves and say, What's the investment we should make now? And then at the end of that test, we can decide on, on our next investment. And then last but not least, you got to rely on a healthy combination of your intuition and data to make more informed decisions. Think of uh, this integration as um, a checks and balance to whatever you're doing with marketing, right? Practicing moderation isn't always easy. We're, we're prone to jump on the new shiny thing or add more resources to something to try it, make it work, to compete, whatever it may be, you know, through over-eagerness. Uh, but by using both data and intuition, you can double-check everything you're doing to make sure you're on track for success. Uh, think of data, uh, using data alone, unfortunately, doesn't give you the full picture. You might see positive ROI and say, we should just double our efforts. We should just move forward. This makes sense for us um, without getting the greater context, whereas the greater context fr comes from your intuition as a marketer. Um, your intuition as a marketer is your experience, your knowledge of the brand, your knowledge of your customer. And you need that context to inform data, to inform the data you're looking at to make you know, complete uh, decisions, but if you're also just looking at using your intuition without data, then you have nothing to support your arguments other than the experiences you have from the past, which won't always be applicable for the future. So you got to combine the two to make more informed decisions. That's what Pottery Barn did at 
eventually. Initially, they were operating on just kind of looking at their data. Um, in about 2014, I believe, they wanted to make Pinterest a leading channel for their organization. At that point, they haphazardly used Pinterest to upload pins that were very product focused. And it kind of worked. I mean, they were seeing a positive ROI because the type of stuff Pottery Barn sells, home goods and home decor stuff, does really well on Pinterest just kind of naturally. And they saw a positive ROI and without much, you know, more in-depth thinking, they just said, let's double the amount of pins we're sharing. Let's reach a wider range of our audience and see if that works. Well, it didn't. Uh, according to TrackMaven, a content marketing measurement tool, when they increased the amount of product-focused pins they were uploading significantly, their engagement crashed. And they saw a 73% decrease in engagement, um, which is a combination of repins, likes, comments, traffic from their Pinterest. So they took a step back and said, whoa, that was a poor decision on our part. We're looking at the data. We're seeing what we have in front of us. Now let's rely on our intuition as well and add that as a, another important layer that we missed before. Pottery Barn's expertise, that something that people go to the brand for is insights on design. How do I make a house into a home? How do I make my bathroom more pretty or my desk a better workspace? So they used that context and said, hey, maybe we should be really more focused on that because that's what's worked with us before. That's what we're really known for. So they applied that to their approach with Pinterest and it worked. They created how-to pins, um, you know, how to stylize your bedroom, how to stylize your bathroom. They included really in-depth captions, which they weren't doing before, and they removed the overt, overt product focus uh, to their pins. And as a result, they are able to share far less, uh, far fewer amount of pins because they were going more deep with the effort they were making to, to create them. And as a result, they skyrocketed in, in engagement because they took a step back, they moderated their marketing a bit, they found that right balance for them of intuition and data. How can your organization do the same, you know, marry and integrate the two in an effective way? Uh, I recommend starting, well, first off, you already have your intuition as a marketer, I would hope. Otherwise, you know, you're, you have your intuition because you're, that's, you're hired to do your job. You have an experience as a marketer. If you don't have it, then it's, you know, not going to last long. But in terms of collecting data, that's not so easy. So you've got to build a measurement toolkit. And I say toolkit because you need to rely on a couple analytics tools to start pulling in relevant data about marketing and the business overall so that you can access them later to make decisions. And then the really important thing to remember is the ability to quickly analyze data. I can't tell you how many clients I've worked with as a marketing consultant. When I'm first you know, pitching them or in our initial stages of a, of a project together, these enterprise brands, large companies with you know, vast expertise, have marketing tools that they're spending ten to $30,000 on a month, and that all they can do with them is create basic reports. Yikes. I don't want that for you. I want you to train your talent internally so you have the skill sets to analyze data in a timely manner so you can make more informed decisions or hire a third party partner to do the training for you, to do all the analysis for you. Either way, you need to be able to look at the data and make quicker decisions, uh, more informed decisions. And then lastly, you need to coordinate all the stakeholders that touch marketing. Everyone that's working with Marketing needs to be clear that that's how you're going to move forward is by balancing both coordinate uh, by balancing both integration and data for a more informed approach to all your marketing decisions. I implore you to avoid diminishing returns or even worse, killing your go-to marketing strategy via over eagerness. Instead, I really hope that you practice moderation with your marketing to drive real business value for your organization and not tick off and irritate or annoy your customers in the meantime. If you'd like to stay in touch, I uh, release a bi-weekly newsletter where I'm always talking about no fluff, hype free uh, marketing tactics. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter by simply texting 44 
two two two. That's just four four two two two. And then in the text message field, all caps moderation, and it'll ask you for your email. And if you sign up, you get a free content marketing style guide that I created, which focuses on how to communicate better and write better as a marketer, one facet of moderation that I didn't have time for today. Thank you very much.